The views and opinions expressed by presenters and guests are their own and do not necessarily reflect the official policy or position of Parasearch UK Radio or its affiliates and sponsors. Listener discretion is advised. You're listening to Paranormal Concept, right here on Parasearch UK Radio, with your host, Paul Brooke. Good evening and welcome to the Paranormal Concept Show. My name is Kerry Greenaway, and I know you're used to hearing the dulcet tones of Mr Paul Rook, but he's still on holiday, so you've just got me at the moment. But I am joined in the studio tonight by an absolutely amazing person. He's an international psychic medium, a paranormal investigator. He is a researcher, mostly well known for his ITC research and bringing experiments and new equipment into the field. He's a public speaker. He's also a psychic. I mean, gosh, there's so many talents to this man. It's absolutely untrue. Please welcome to the studio, Mr. Chris Fleming. Hello, Chris. Hi, Carrie. Thanks for having me on. I appreciate it. Oh, you're very welcome. I'm absolutely blown away you're on, to be fair. In your busy Why? schedule, because you're so busy all the time. Um, yeah, you know it's yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, what is it you're actually doing right at the moment? Because you're you're preparing because it's Halloween coming up very shortly. So, what is it you're doing right at the moment? Yeah, October obviously is a, is a busy season due to Halloween here, you know, in the states. And you do you guys celebrate Halloween in the UK? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Just, <laughs> oh, yeah. Know. You know what's so funny is I, I once asked that question when I was doing the TV show Dead Famous. I asked my co-host that, Gail, and our producer, mm. Charlotte. And they said, of course, and they looked at me really strange. But, you know, sometimes you forget. You don't know, you know, do you celebrate this holiday, that holiday? You know, who knows? But um, it is the busy time of the year for that. And I speak at colleges, universities, and, of course, do ghost hunts all over the place. So I'm leaving to go on my tour on Thursday morning, so I'm trying to get everything prepared for that. I'm going to be speaking at three different colleges, uh, then I come back for one day, and then I fly out to Vegas to prepare for Ghost Adventures Live, which we'll be doing on Halloween night from Zach's mansion, the Haunted Mansion, which he's been telling me about for years mm-hmm. and been wanting me to come, him and Aaron, and I'm finally going to go see this museum, but I'll be investigating it, and we'll be talking about it, obviously, live for four hours, so Ooh. that's exciting. Then I come back for like two days and then I fly out to the UK for Sage Paracon. Yes. Yes, you're coming over to the UK. Yes. I love that. I have to to tell you this, Carrie, is, you know, when I did Dead Famous back in, uh, we we started filming in 2003 and and we filmed all the way until 2006 and we did a live episode and we filmed in the United States, but I worked with an entire British company. I worked with... uh, uh, two four productions, and I loved everybody that was on the crew. We we had such a great great group, and we became family. And but we always filmed in the United States. I was the yeah. only American on the entire production, and I always wanted to go to the UK. So you know we didn't get to do that. But I was also I started doing events in two thousand and six. You know all over the United States, and I always wanted the UK, and I never got an opportunity to go to the UK to you know share my passion for what I do and talk about my story of why I do what I do because a lot yeah. of people don't know they think oh you just got selected you're on TV and now you're a paranormal investigator yeah, that's not the yeah. case no TV found me it's something I've been doing my whole life so the thing is is telling people they want to know what you've done and what which why you do what you do and the stories you've had and the evidence you've gotten so this is finally coming true it's been on my bucket list is I'm now coming to the UK for Sage Paracon 3, mm-hmm. uh, to meet the fans and, you know, some of the other colleagues out there, as well as, you know, we'll get into that in a minute, but um, I'm excited. I'm really excited. And the thing that makes it so so great also is that my buddy, my sidekick, my partner in crime, uh, Barry Guy, is going to be there too. 
Yeah, we spoke to him a couple of weeks ago on Parasearch Radio and he was very excited as well. And I, was, I spoke to him actually about, oh gosh, about a year and a half ago. And he was, um, the concept of Help My House is Haunted had only just sort of like, um, was that only just sort of put out there and he was searching for locations at that time. So we spoke to Barry like before it was on and now it's really exciting because it's been on and we've seen it and it, it's right. fantastic. And it looks right. like you had a great time. Um, <coughs> Now, one thing I would like to ask you about that, if that's okay, is Sandy Lakdar um, mm-hmm. is the other co-host of that show, isn't she? There's the three of you there. <coughs> Pardon me. Um, where's the, uh, how does that dynamic work between the three of you? Well, it's interesting because we had talked um, prior to that, uh, unknowingly, um, you know, I didn't know Sandy was going to be on the show yet. Um, I talked to Zach about the show, you know, some ideas and stuff like that a couple of years ago and before this actually became a reality. And then when he told me that he's, uh, you know, he has sold something to the UK market and some people are going to be on it. When he told me Sandy Lactor, I said, oh, my God, I've, I've talked to her a couple of times in the past. She had bought some ghost hunting equipment from me from my, my store, ghostoutlet.com. And we had shared some conversations, our interest and our research with the spirit box, and she was getting some great results on it. So she told me about the paranormal series she was doing called The Believers. So she sent me some links, and I watched it, and I wrote back on, you know, I've seen so many different paranormal shows, some good, some bad, some, you know, don't even want to mention. Yeah. And, and I wrote her back saying, wow, this is really good. I mean, uh, unfortunately, I couldn't understand everything she was saying because it was all in, in French. She then sent me one that had the, uh, the English uh, subtitles. But I was amazed at the uh, professionalism that she had in, in, in those series. So I had already known her from that, from mm-hmm. communicating through the internet. And we jumped, I think we jumped on Skype once and we talked. So I was familiar with who she was. So I said, okay, that's good. But this Barry guy, you know, I don't know who he is, right? <laughs> and uh, and I, I felt having done a lot of paranormal TV and done a lot of stuff, you know, for 18 years now. Well, it's actually, yeah, 18 years now. Um, I was a consultant doing shows back in 2000 and then, of course, got to do Dead Famous. I realized that for us to really bond, we got to get to know each other. So we had a bunch of Skype phone calls. And I would send questions. I said, hey, I got an idea. Why don't we each send each other 10 questions and we'll all answer them? You know, so Mm -hmm. we all sent questions to each other and we got to know a little bit more about each other, which was great going in there. It's like we had always known each other before we started filming. But there still is that chemistry, getting to know that chemistry. And I remember the day that I landed um, and they brought me to the hotel we're staying at and I got to meet Barry face to face. And it was something where I knew within like an hour that we were going to get along great. I mean, we were buddies uh, from the get-go. So we had this type of uh, uh, partnership that was just funny because he has a great sense of humor. And what a lot of people don't know, you know, seeing me on TV is I'm a smart ass. <laughs> and, and you'll see little bits and pieces of it in, in Help My House is Haunted, little sarcasms and stuff like that with, you know – like the claw that I did with uh, Sandy and, and, you know, I'm, we're driving and I have ADHD a lot sometimes. So I will totally just go off and I think, and I see these cows and I go, Oh, look cows, you know? And, (laughs) and I did that humorously and you get to see bits and pieces of that in help. My house is haunted. Mm -hmm. Um, so the fact that Barry has that same sense of humor, we bonded right away. And then, you know, Sandy didn't quite understand our humor at times. <laughs> so it's funny. She would try to tell a joke or say something funny. We'd both look at her like we don't get it. Then both him and I would be laughing about something and she'd feel, out, you know, kind of out of place. But it, it took a while and we were all able to get along really well. Um, you know, but Barry and I hit it off right from, this, from the start. Fantastic. Now, I actually watched an episode recently, which was the one at Chillingham Castle. Okay, that is, you know, and I, I, you know, people always say don't talk, uh, don't be negative about anything, but that is my, probably my least favorite episode of the series. Mm -hmm. It was my favorite place to go to um, out of all the places we went to because of the personal experiences I have there and some of the unanswered questions that I had pertaining to possibly a past life connection. 
mm-hmm. um, which I would love to go back there and I have an idea, you know, why we go back there and what we could do and pursue that. But obviously it's going to be up to the network and the producers. But that was probably our – one of our last episodes we shot, the last block. Yeah. And they used it as the first as the first episode. So it wasn't the, – the what I saw – to me, there's other episodes I like better in the way they came across. I think okay. there was some missing elements to that show that people didn't get to see. It, that, that's what I got, actually, out of it when I watched it. I thought there was a lot more that had gone on and, and that you oh, yeah. you personally, from a psychic level, was able to um, ascertain from that location, which wasn't translated um, or wasn't being able to to be translated through onto the show. Now, is that one of the most frustrating things, working as a medium and then working with TV? It is the number one most most frustrating thing is that, um, you know, without getting too much into it, is, is trying to find a director that completely understands the paranormal and that listens to the importance of certain details that need to be in a show. Mm-hmm. And, and what happens, you know, I've been doing this, you know, 18 years, um, and I know the stories and things that occur with these spirits and what they're telling me and how important it is to try to get that across. But because people don't have that perspective, or they don't have that experience or they don't they don't see what I see or feel what I feel. It doesn't make it. And it's unfortunate because there was some other stories and more deep stories that could have been told in Chillingham that weren't. Um, in particular, some of the EVPs that uh, Barry and I got are just extraordinary uh, incredible A grade EVPs, and one of the EVPs was was this male voice um, thanked me at the very end. Says thank you, Chris, for getting me out, mm. um, getting him out. I, I can't remember as, as I had it in front of me because I've listened to hundreds of hours of audio. <laughs> yeah, and it was basically thanking me for getting this person or this ghost out of Chillingham that had been trapped there for so long. Um, there was other EVPs that confirmed some of the stuff that I experienced as well as what Barry was getting in the torture area. Now, we do know, and the one thing that doesn't come across is that well aware, and it was something that I had mentioned, is that this didn't seem like the torture area. The torture area actually existed underneath Chillingham, but that is like kind of some of the pieces they had from then and some of our museum pieces, and I was well aware of that. And and that was mentioned uh, in the show as we were investigating, but yet it doesn't make it there. So people think, oh, they don't realize this and that. But what people don't realize is that different from some other shows, some shows may go in there for three, four hours and film and that's it. But we go there uh, later in the day. I do my walkthrough, which is about two hours, anywhere from an hour and a half to two hours long, sometimes a little bit more. And they document that. And I'm telling you everything that I'm getting, what I'm seeing and what I'm experiencing. And some of the stuff that I get is just extraordinary, but yet it doesn't make it on the show mm. because they only allot maybe five minutes, eight minutes to that part that I'm doing combined with what Sandy's getting from her interviews and what Barry's getting from his interviews. So you don't get to see all of that. So a lot of that's missing, but yet you'll see later in the show me talking about something because I had brought it up earlier during the yeah. car ride. Mm-hmm. And – we then go to we, – we get together and I share what I got. They tell me what they got and what the history is and they would compare what I get and what they get to see where we need to go. And if I really feel strongly about something that doesn't really match with the history and everything, I said I still need to pursue this because I think this is something that they've missed or something that is unknown or unexplained. So we'll pursue it. But then when we start our ghost hunt, I mean we'll go out to dinner. We'll break. We'll do all these other things and – we will start anywhere between 8 to 10 p.m. is when we will start setting up to ghost hunt. And we go until 7, 8 in the morning. Mm. So we're going for you know anywhere between 10 to possibly 12 hours on a straight through ghost hunt. Mm-hmm. And, and that doesn't, of course, include the walkthrough that I already did. So during that time period, we're up the entire time. We're investigating. The crew is filming. So they have just you know hundreds of hours – of footage from the entire show because if they're filming three or four cameras and they're going for 10 hours, you know, that's a lot of stuff when it gets all added up. But there's so much that goes on that we get. They obviously can't put it all in and, you know, and if they want to follow a certain storyline with a boy spirit or a woman spirit, sometimes those other spirits that we got in contact with get edited out. Yeah. And it's really, 
it's really unfortunate because some of the evidence is probably some of the greatest evidence I've ever seen in my career. Um, but I don't have the final say to that, and it, you know, it's up to their hands. You know, I'm always trying to find some transition state to where that can get broadcast and where that can get implemented. But there is so much more to them what people see going on and what we get. Because I remember reading some, well, they didn't get any evidence. It goes, well, actually, we got so much evidence at Chillingham, you just didn't hear it. They didn't, they didn't put it in show. So people need to understand that there's a lot that goes on that just doesn't get in there. And we just don't have that control yet, you know, to allow that. But it's a great episode and it's, it, it, the series is good. It's just I feel that there's so much more from my perspective it was put in, it would blow people away. Do you think um, there should be a responsibility of the TV companies to actually show that side of it rather than focusing on, like you say, the small part of it? you know really just get straight into the nitty-gritty because like you say you've worked as a psychic medium for for like basically a 14 15 hour stretch at times when you do yeah. these shows that's yeah. a lot of energy and work yeah. expelled for, from not just yourself but from your spirit team above as well and the spirits that are surrounding you at the locations that you go to that's not giving them justice really and although i appreciate television shows um are not just about the subject matter that's being put forward. Right. It's about ratings and advertising and, and things like that. Do you not feel we could move the, the TV programming forward more? Um, I think it's necessary. And in my career, that's what I want to do. I don't want to do anything else. I don't want to go backwards. Mm -hmm. uh, times I feel we were going backwards uh, by watching because stuff is taken out. And, um, we, you know, there's some strives we make and there's, there's, uh, uh, you know, some great things you see in some of the episodes that is above and beyond. Mm -hmm. But there is so much more. And all three of us, please keep in mind, all three of us have discussed this, yeah. um, our, our frustrations. And then, of course, you know, patting each other in the back for the, their great job that they did and, and what they've gathered and the evidence that they've got. But the thing is, is that there's so much more that could be shown that would evolve not only the field, but evolve everybody's understanding of the spirit world. Mm -hmm. And that's what I'm really, you know, if, if we end up doing a second season, you know, I, I demand that that stuff gets put in, and, and I demand that this this evolution is shown of what's really going on. Because if it isn't, it's just watering down a program that is making it, you know, like everything else um, out there. You know, and I'm not trying to knock it or anything. It's just no. I know the potential. It's you know, like I was a football coach, and I knew what players were good and what players weren't, and I knew that how to kind of bring them together. So I scratched the entire team brought in a whole new team of who was the best at each thing they did, kind of like, you know, Sandy, myself, and Barry. And I knew how to utilize each person to accomplish a successful season. Well, we went undefeated. Not only did we go undefeated, but we broke all these records in both offense and defense because everybody was there for a specific reason. And I allowed each person to do their job and express themselves, which showed. The same thing is when, when you are doing a documentary series or you're doing a, a TV show, it's important to allow each person to do the best thing that they do and to show what they do because they're, they're experienced in that for a specific reason. So why not really spotlight that? And then when they get information, even if you don't understand, they understand and the field understands and other ones. So it's important to show that. I'll give you a perfect example. The Fulford uh, mansion we went to when we were driving in the car, and you could watch this on the episode, is I'm in the car and I started, I started getting really – weird feelings that and I start seeing in my mind's eye all these people coming out of the forests and why I was like okay who are all these people like, oh my god there's lots of them and then I recognized with the beards the blood the the swords the shields and they were from different generations of different warriors and different vikings and stuff like that and I'm like who are you and the one looks at me and goes are are you the one and I go what do you mean am I the one you know why are you what, what do you want to say to me and another one comes up is he the one and I said, what are you talking about? He says, are you the one that's going to send us home? And I said, oh, my God. And I said, okay, I, I understand. And then he started telling me a few more things. And both Sandy and Barry are asking me questions. And I'm like, well, there's, I see them coming forward. And then they're showing me flashes of them fighting, dying on the land. I go, there was great battles and wars here. I'm seeing all these soldiers. Well, they cut it. Just when I'm about to say soldiers, they cut it in the edit. And I'm like, why? I'm just about to say that. So – that was my number one focus, that, and then there was a woman uh, that, was, that I was sensing and seeing when we got there. So that whole night while we're doing the ghost hunt, we're coming in contact with various spirits and helping one cross over and this and that, um, I knew that I had to go back out there and confront these soldiers. 
So when we go out there to confront them in the morning, I said, we need to do it in the morning just before the sun comes up because we need a new beginning for them. And I remember taking my recorder out and I said, uh, I know you're here. How many of you are here? And the EVP says thousands. Wow. I play it back. It says thousands. And I said, okay, can you prove to me and the crew that you're actually here? Will you scream out and yell so we can hear you and I'll record you with my device? Well, as soon as I ask that, you start hearing all the animals. And you see that on the show. You start hearing all the animals yelling. Well, the whole crew got actually freaked out. I'm surprised they didn't interview any of them or, or ask them about it because they'd been there for two days doing general views and shooting the, the location and everything. They said they hadn't heard any animals except just a couple geese that would yell occasionally. Mm. But we heard cows, wolves, dogs, uh, sheep, you know, birds, just you name it, everywhere. I knew from being a paranormal researcher and also somewhat of a scientist what was going on in the infrasound and electromagnetic field is that all the animals were responding to, no different than a natural disaster such as an earthquake or a tsunami that's coming, they know that the environment's being affected. So there had to be a disturbance in the electromagnetic field or in the infrasound that was causing this to get all the animals to respond at the same time. Mm -hmm. So I knew there's going to be something on here. Well, when I play it back, I hear what sounds like a crowd yelling. So I remember talking to our sound technician. We put it into my computer, and we amplified it, and I said... I said, listen to this. And he's like, oh, my God. What happened was is I said, you know, I'm going to record this. Give me a sign that you're all here. And you hear these multiple men yell, hey, they found us. Yay. And they, you hear like the cheer of hundreds, if not thousands of men yelling. And as soon as they yell, you start hearing all the animals. So I. I've got it on audio. And then they, they quiet down, the men, and then they yell again like they cheer, like, yay! And all the animals start yelling again. Now, this went on for about 30 seconds, and I have it on recording. It, to me, it was the most significant electronic voice phenomena find because not only was it supported by my questions as a medium and what I was coming up with, but it was also we have tangible proof on video of the animals responding, which how are we going to get the animals to respond unless something happened, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. And it happened because they heard the vibration and the yelling of these soldiers. Well, unfortunately, in the show, they don't play that EVP. They just play what was caught on the camera, but not the amplified recording. So at Sage Paracon, I'm going to play this for everybody. Oh, I'm gonna, my goodness. I'm gonna, Brilliant. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to bring the EVP so you guys can hear it, and you'll be able to hear the soldiers yell. To me, this was incredible because it was very touching for me. Later in the audio... I asked them, I said, why are you still here? And they said, we died here. And I said, okay, but why are you still here? He says, nobody prayed for us. How sad. That's actually Here's sad. Here's the thing. <laughs> I, I talked to a historian and I asked him questions about, you know, we found out that there was, there was hundreds of battles, or many battles. I don't want to say hundreds, it might be exaggeration. But there were so many battles on this land over centuries that what, what would happen in those days is that they would bury the dead right there. You know, if they were enemies or whatever, is that if they weren't claimed or whatever, they would just big trenches and bury them there. Yeah. Well, in those days, thousands of a thousand years ago, hundreds of years ago, when someone would die in battle or someone would die, they would have a big funeral. They would have a ritual. They would burn their body. Or they would do a special cultural thing that they would do to make sure that their soul went to the other side, yeah. went to Valhalla or went to heaven or went to whatever they called it. Mm -hmm. Well, imagine all these soldiers with that belief system, with that religious system in their culture, that no one's there to pray for them and send them off. So they're stuck there. Mm -hmm. And they've been stuck for that whole period of time. So I said, OK, so I did prayers for the dead. And, you know, I went through multiple different prayers that I used to send spirits off. And the interesting thing occurred in one of the audios. It says, we have to go now. Thank you. Reggie's calling us. And I'm like, Reggie? Oh, my God. Reggie's my father who passed away in 2009. My father has appeared in many different ghost hunts that I've done and also some of the investigations. And he appeared a few times through the audio recording of the spirit box when we were at the cage and some of the other places. And they said, your dad's here, Reggie. And, it would say, and he would say, I love you. And he would say the things he usually tells me. And the director had heard the I love you. She was, oh, my God, I heard that. And I said, yeah, that's my dad. She's like, no, I, I, I really heard that. I heard that. I said, I know. I said, that's just my dad talking. And he would pop in once in a while. My dad was considered a warrior in hockey. He was a fighter. For 13 yeah. years, he played in NHL. 
he was considered a warrior. So it made sense that my dad was on the other side yelling for them, telling them, come into the light and to assist in this, this transition. Yeah. So for me, it was such a remarkable moment when I was analyzing the audio. I got very emotional, very emotional that there is something bigger going on with what we do that people don't always get to see. And for me, it's important that people do see this, hear this, and experience that with us because it will help evolve ghost hunting to not just ghost hunting for thrills, but ghost hunting with responsibility to also try to assist some of these spirits and to send them home. Mm -hmm. You know, some ghost hunters have told me, like, I don't want to do that because, you know, we don't want to do that to our place because we want them to still be haunted so they're here so we can sell tickets. And I said, but, you know, that's slavery. That's that's like a form of slavery is you're trapping them here. Trust me, there's so many spirits in the world that why not send some of them home? Yeah, it's a responsibility to the souls. Correct. I agree. Um, I'd like to take you away a little bit from your TV work because we've watched you um, over the years, like you say, 18 years doing TV. I'd like to talk to you more about your um, connection to spirit. And and some people have one spirit guide, some people have several. Do you have a specified spirit guide or do you have um, just an open connection? How does it work for you? I know that there are spirit guides because I've come in contact with them and I don't know their names. For me, it was always I had some type of connection that I don't understand exactly why yet. There are some theories based on my experiences, but I don't want to jump to a specific conclusion that I have a strong connection with angels. And because I've seen angels since my childhood and occasionally an angel will manifest and show itself at a time when either I'm doing prayers for the dead or helping an animal crossover that's been put to sleep, or if, if there's a demonic infestation in a house, I'm confronting a demonic entity, and the entity reveals itself to me to where I see it, or attacks, I have, had, have seen angels appear and do what they do, and sometimes deliver a clear statement or a very simple message with just a few words. They won't have a conversation back and forth. Uh, they're very stoic and very quiet, unless they are allowed to deliver or say something that won't affect my entire life, but will just suit its purpose for that precise moment. Um, I have a hard time believing people that say that they speak to the angels all the time and they talk back and they go back and forth because my experiences I've had my entire life and even my out-of-body experiences is that's not allowed. Mm. It's not allowed because you are supposed to have this experience here and not be distracted by communicating with them, and it goes into how do you know you're even talking to an angel, could be a demonic entity, this and that, they can pretend, is that they're not allowed to interfere. And that's what happened with the fallen, which when you look at the book of Enoch and you look at certain scriptures, um, that the angels fell because they started having that relationship with uh, the physical, with, with the humans, and they started communicating too much that it wasn't allowed because you can't disrupt this environment, this this study, these these people that are existing in a different dimension Otherwise, you will confuse them. They will start treating you like gods. They will believe in miracles or they will try to constantly ask you for help or advice instead of just helping themselves yeah. and doing what they're supposed to do. Mm-hmm. So what I've been told is that we're not allowed to intervene like that unless he, the creator, tells us to um, and unless we're called upon for something that serves a greater purpose. So for me, when I have occasionally seen them, there's even times they put me in my place I had this entity, it was back in uh, January of 2011, I had done a demonic case and this demon jumped on top of me and it was holding me down to where I couldn't breathe. And my girlfriend at the time saw my body concave into the the bed and she jumped off terrified. Um, And I said, do you see it? She's like, no. And And then I saw this thing on me. She went and got the holy water and I communicated with this thing just briefly and it then all of a sudden the thing opened up and these lights came down and these angels... And I said to the angels, wow, you do this for me to protect me from these demons? And they said, no, we do this for everybody. Mm -hmm. And that was such an important thing. It's like, you're not special to where we just do this for you, okay? Mm -hmm. You know, we do this for everybody. And then I realized the responsibility I had with that statement, how it put me in my place, which I needed to be put in my place, to realize that this goes on all the time, even if people don't believe in them. And they don't do it to, to get aware. It's like, hey, the angel saved me. Thank you. Hey, you're welcome. All right. See you later. You know? <laughs> they don't do that. 
they, they do it because they love us, they care about us, and because the creator tells them to. And they're not looking for approval or likes or pats on the back. No, they, they don't do it because of ego. They do it because that is their existence is mm -hmm. to do that. And they don't question it. So they said, no, we do this for everybody, not just you, because we don't want you going around, hey, these angels appear for me and they protected me. And it, no, 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 no. We do this for everybody. So I – I put my faith and trust in them, um, but I have had experiences pop in uh, of spirits sometimes that have guided me or told me certain things and ones that have tried to lie to me that I confront and question. So that is my protection. That is what I go to. I think that's a pretty awesome way of putting it, actually, because I think um, there is a – how shall I put this without sounding rude – a genre – of people talking about angels and like you say channeling angels every five minutes and um when you said like you know they don't do it for likes i just just imagine archangel michael on social media going hey <laughs> yeah and then wanting like a million yeah. likes and, and you're dead right whenever i've encountered which is not often um that kind of entity it's not been something that you could have I had a conversation with it. it they've came in done what they need to do and gone straight away it's not that close an interaction whereas when yeah. you get a spirit from like a human spirit that's they want that interaction they want to pass that right. message on and tell their story well said well said you know uh, i was doing a, a ghost at one of these colleges and we had there were some negative entities coming through and then some spirits kept saying prayer prayer and they will know somehow they'll know what i do at times when i come there and other people that do what they do as well it's not just me there's so many people that are aware of this with prayers for the dead and i think it's important but the the spirits were saying, prayer, prayer, take us home, take us to the light. You know, we can tell by your energy you've done that for others. So I said, okay. So I, I did some prayers and, and I said, the whole students, I go, everybody say our father with me. And we said our father. And then I did prayers for the dead. I want everybody to focus on the angels coming to help us. And then all of a sudden you hear the spirit box start saying, angels, the light, there's three of them. And then you hear this voice so powerful that comes through the spirit box goes, awaken now. And all the students were like, oh, my God. I go, you guys all hear that? What are you going to say? said, awaken now. I said, that was one of the angels. And the angel said, awaken now. And I remember researching awaken now and seeing some of the scriptures that, you know, Christ would come and, and, and even another scripture that he would send his angels to awaken the dead. And for it to say that from thousands of years ago, the, the scripture to say that and, and here it was being broadcast through the spirit box by this powerful force that said, awaken now, it made me understand like, hey, wake up, wake up. You're no longer dead. You're no longer in this depression. You're no longer suffering. We're here for you. Do you want to go? And they're just like, and when I heard that and I, it was backed by scripture, I was like, you know, we're getting into, we're involved in something very important. And I want to say it's greater. It's, it's part of a purpose that we all have, but it's also a responsibility. So when people say, oh, you're a ghost hunter, I said, well, I don't like the word ghost hunter. I'm way more than that. That's someone that just looks for ghosts and gets thrills and gets a few EVPs or hopes to get a photograph or a video and gets spooked and that's it. Okay. I don't know what to call myself for a term. And you know what? I don't need to, to, to label in anything. My responsibility is to help the spirits there in any way I can. That's my responsibility, not just communicate with them, get them to say hi or I hate you or this or that, but to actually have a dialogue with them, try to find out why they're there and what I can do to assist them. Yeah, and that, that's what it's about, isn't it? It's help. It's about helping. But this is what I do. Yeah, but it's even beside the program, Help My House is Haunted. This is something I've been doing for years. Yeah. So – I, you know, I jumped on it when Zach says, hey, you know, I'd like to have you do this. Would you like to do this? I said, absolutely, because it's, it's something that I've always wanted to do. So, but the thing is, is that I want people to see more of that interaction. I want people to see more of the spirits responding in kind, thanking us, as well as explaining why they're there and how we're doing it. Uh, it's not just, you know, incense in a bowl going boom. I mean, you know, there's a ritual that yes. goes on for like 15 to 15 minutes to a half hour that I do on the entire property from room to room, you know, with the holy water and the prayers and, you know, and we don't get to do the whole thing at every, vac at every location because some of the owners don't want us to remove them. You know, they just want to find out what's there. So we're not allowed to. So I have to, you know, be responsible. Yeah. 
be and respectful tough. to the people that are, yeah. are living with that. But that's tough because you also have to be responsible to the spirits and the souls that, that are incarnate there. You know, um, it, it's a balance, isn't it? It's trying to get that balance yeah. sometimes. It's very difficult. Yeah, yeah um, and I, you know, I, saw, I saw a comment once. Someone said, you know, hey, wow, you guys just you, you banged a bowl a couple times and all of a sudden the spirits cross the, oh, the other side. Okay, sure. Well, you don't see the half hour of us doing the prayers and all the other rituals that we do around the entire property inside and out to do that. And you don't see the interaction because I usually use a spirit box when we do this sometimes. You don't hear them talk back and forth while we're doing this. So unfortunately, people don't get to see all that. You know, so they would have a better understanding of what we're actually doing. Do you think it would give people a better understanding or do you think it would um, give them a false tool? Because um, when you've done these kind of rituals yourself, you know that there's a lot more to it on an energy level than just wandering around and burning your incense and banging your bowl and, you know, doing the, the things that you have to do. There's a much more work that's done from an energetic perspective. So if you did put that process out... Do you think people would just take that and think they know best now? So it's a what good idea that? that we don't show that because they haven't done the knowledge work for themselves, that, that internal learning process themselves, that it's a kind more of, of an energetic thing than it is just well, it is, tools. Yeah it, is a, yeah, it is an energetic thing. But it's one thing like I, I, I told Barry and Sandy, I said, you know, the only way I'm going to do this show and continue to do this show is if I'm allowed to help these spirits and to do what I do. OK, mm-hmm. um, whether they film it or not. And, and, you know, if you want to film it or not, that's fine. And that's the way I was. I, you know, when we were done and we wrapped, they started wrapping up. I would still go continue to do what I needed to do, whether they're filming or not, because obviously the universe is bringing me there for a specific reason. And I have that reason to fulfill. It's not just like when the cameras go off, I'm done doing what I'm doing. No, I continue to do it. And this sometimes even progresses, you know, that night into my hotel room or the next day when these spirits are still coming to me. Uh So you don't get to see that. But I feel it's important that we're at this level now, gosh darn it, you know, and I want to scream and yell to be heard, is that allow me to assist and, and, and show the public more to what needs to be done it's time that ghost hunting shows evolve and it's time we move to the next level let us move to the next level Mm -hmm. let let us be shown let it be shown in what we do that it moves to the next level and you know and i think that's important I do too. I think that's incredibly important. Um, and you've, right, you're going to Coomer Abbey with Sage Paranormal, uh, Sage Paracon, sorry. Um, you said earlier on that you're very excited about that. You get to investigate it as well. Yeah, that's really cool. It, and it's, um, I've never been there. I do, it, it, wasn't Most Haunted there once? Was Most Haunted ever there? I don't somebody... know. I think it's been, um, how should I put that? Um, it has been looked at, but I wouldn't say investigated properly. Not not to MJ standards of investigating. Yeah, right. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Good. Good. Because I, I've never been there, and I'm looking forward to it. Um, and you know, we'll see what happens. Um, but it's. But I love going to the UK and investigating these places because some of them were really interesting compared to places in the United States. I mean, Queen Mary, Stanley Hotel, and some of the other places I've been to have just been incredible every time I go there. Mm -hmm. But to come in contact with spirits that are hundreds, if not thousands of years older, they tend to be more aware of the quantum physics and everything that's involved in the multi-dimensions to interact. And they tend to cause things like during the cage, you know, just before I started doing the ritual, I got grabbed in the crotch. (laughs) And, and, And I leaned over and I looked at the crew, and this happened to me once when I was doing Dead Famous. Mm. But I looked at the crew, and I'm like, because there was a part of me that was about to get excited from that. And then there was a part of me saying, no, it's a ploy. It's a ploy of this demonic entity to distract you from what you're supposed to do, to be pure in thought, to do the prayers. And I kind of told the crew what just happened, and some laughed and this and that, and I explained. And then I said, oh, my God, you know, it's trying to find my weakness. So... um you know, it's things like this that goes on that, you know, it wouldn't hurt to put in the show because it shows the reality of what we have to deal with on a conscious as well as a spiritual level. Mm-hmm. And, um, you know. Well, when you are investigating Coom Abbey, I just want to give this a shout out because there there are some tickets, very, very few though, guys out there, um, to actually investigate and join the celebrity investigation. Now, there's only going to be 10 people in each group. So when you're with the celebrity um, 
guest speakers, there's only going to be a small amount of you. So you actually get to really investigate with the, the celebrity that you're with and you get a chance to do it with all of them. Okay. Now you get time in various areas with them and you try different experiments. What experiments will you be trying, Chris? Well, the one thing is, you know, I've, I've been doing this for 12 years now with these ghost hunts with groups, and, and I love doing this because people get to see exactly what we do for themselves, yeah. not what you see on TV, but in reality. So I think I might be matched up with Barry or not. I'm not sure if I am. That's great. Um, but is I will show them what I do. I will I'll show them how to focus your thoughts and everything and open yourself up to have experiences and connect with the electromagnetic field to where your consciousness now becomes a part of the room. So you can detect when you feel changes in the room just like I do. Mm. So I'm going to share that with them and how I do that. Then also we're going to come in contact with any of the spirits I come in contact with. I'm going to have them come forward and validate that they're there so that they can hear if I say there's a female, there's a male, and if I get their name or whatever else, I'm going to have them talk to us and people will have their devices, the EVP recorders, we'll have the spirit box, stuff like that. So we'll see if they come through to confirm that. Then I will um, answer any questions that anybody has, show them some other techniques of ghost hunting, and then allow them to communicate and interact with these spirits as well. So I will have them ask questions to the spirit box and the other devices we have so that they can get some of the results very similar to what we get. Um, you know, some may get responses, some may not. Mm -hmm. But this is going to allow them to be front and center, allow them to do exactly what we do and see it live. And I know, having done this for 12 years, some of the things that happen are unbelievable. <laughs> and people walk away. I've had skeptics go, well, I came in here and I just wanted to bust you or, I, you know, your chops or whatever or call you a fraud and – what I saw and what I experienced, like one guy had saw we were at Eastern State. He saw this black shadow come out of the wall, stand there and go through the wall, and he was so shooken up because he didn't believe in ghosts. He thought he'd just go there and take pictures of them because he was a photographer. He had his first paranormal experience. Wow. And he says, I, 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 I now can't have any hate towards you or anger or frustration because now I want to know more. Because now yeah. I realize what you're doing is real and, and what, what you know, I want to know more now because I don't understand what I just saw. <laughs> so, you know, it's when you have experiences like that, you know, it's, 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 there's a gratitude, but there's also, you know that you also saved that soul. You know that when that person loses a loved one, they're going to know that there is life after death or at least have a bigger understanding of it, and they're going to say prayers, and they're going to be more connected to the spirit world for their time instead of being trapped here and being told to awaken now. Yeah. You know, so that to me is important to save as many souls as I can that way. That is going to be awesome. Like I say, guys, tickets are very, very limited now for Sage Paracon. If you're interested in a ticket, either for the investigation or a day pass or the whole VIP experience, contact um, MJ Dixon. Now, her email is mj at sageparacon.co.uk. And she's just confirmed to me um, that, yeah, you will be with Barry. You and Barry will be doing it together. Oh, that's so whoop, cool. Whoop. That's so cool. <laughs> and it is that's between so cool. the 8th of November um, to the Sunday, the 8th to the 11th. It's cool. It's going to be an yeah, awesome weekend. Is, it's going to be an it absolutely is. awesome weekend is all I I looked can at say. the schedule, all the different things we're going to be doing. Um, it's like going to be one big party from the day you get there yeah. with everybody, with the lectures, with the, the costume party at the night, mm -hmm. and then the ghost hunt, the dinner, and then getting to mingle and hang out with everybody during the day um, and being in this beautiful place. Um, for me, it, it's like I told Barry, God, I want to come back to the UK and you know, because I thought we'd be filming again this year if we were doing a second season. And you know, it hasn't happened, at least not yet. Um, so now that I'm coming back to the UK, uh, I'm excited. I mean, uh, I've, been, I've been telling Barry all the time, dude, I can't wait. I can't wait. I'm so excited. I hope I don't get sick before that. You know, I don't want to be there with, be there with cold and be, not feeling well because traveling so much. I'm like, I got to make sure I'm in my, you know, get enough sleep and be totally healthy because I can't <laughs> just see everybody. You know, he's like, hey, buddy, you know, if you want to stay in my house one day, you can stay in my So we're just, you know, and I, and I, and I reached out to actually Gail Porter because I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stay an extra day. I'm going to go to London and I'm going to go see Gail because I haven't oh. seen Gail since I did Dead Famous in 2006. So uh, I'm really excited to see her. It's been 12 years. Well, you can give Gail a message from me, okay. not that it, for what it's worth. <laughs> Tell her I would like to see a UK version of um, Dead Famous. I think I, she should be back on our TV screens. I used to love that lady. I have told two, four productions. I have, you know, and, and I, I don't know what's going on. I, I know that a network or even the public would want to see it again because yeah. we had – 
uh, two other seasons to do, but you know something happened which did not allow us to do, which I don't need to get into. But people no, can I... read it on the internet. Yeah. And um, you know, I think things have changed since then. But I think it would be great to do the UK and other parts of the world with Dead Famous. I mean, it's something that with the technology I have now. Imagine, you know, Marilyn Monroe, Frank Sinatra, I think, with the Spirit Box, which we didn't oh, have back then. No, I know. How awesome would that be? Exactly. So we'll see. We'll see what happens. Yeah, you can tell her from me. I'm going to say, she doesn't know who I am, but tell her anyway. <laughs> now, guys, if you book more than four tickets for Sage Paracon, you get a group rate. So don't forget, go over to MJ Dixon um, and get in contact with her. If you're interested in any of the packages available for Sage Paracon, you're going to get to meet awesome people like Chris Barry, who we had on a few weeks ago. Oh, the list goes on. Aaron Sagers, Katrina Wildman. Always say her last time wrong. Do apologise. Um, Richard Estep is going to be there. Oh, my goodness. It, it, it's Cal Cooper, the amazing Cal Cooper. And trust right. me, he's awesome. I, I've he is him. awesome. I've met I interviewed him, him on one of my podcasts, and mm. I, I look forward to sitting down with him and discussing – you know, as a fellow colleague, you know, the research into EVP and everything else. And I look forward to meeting uh, the other Barry. And I yes. look forward to, I know Katrina, um, having done events, uh, same events as her since 2006. It'll be great to see her. And Aaron Sagers is a great friend of mine. Um, so I look forward to seeing him as well as meeting some of the other people that I've never met mm. at this event. So it, it's just going to be it just seems – it's like a vacation with friends. So uh, that's what I'm looking forward to. Okay. So what, what's your drink tolerance level like is what I want to know. Are you, are, well, you, are the, you a good drinker or a bad drinker? Because um, you kind of need the, to get in practice a little bit, I feel. Yeah, yeah. I don't, <laughs> I don't drink too much and there's a couple of reasons for that. Uh, one of the reasons is I've come to see – especially myself being under attack like I am, mm. it's when someone is not complete control of their physical and their mental state, um, spirits can slip in. We call it a walk-in. And mm. I know that uh, there was – one of the magazines did an interview on me, and I can't remember which one it was. I think it was Haunted Magazine. In the Haunted Magazine with the Dead Famous interviews, I talked about some of those experiences, as well as in Raw Magazine had an interview where I talked about two women that had been taken over, one of them because she was on a lot of different drugs and, and medications. And because of that, we have walk-ins. I've had where sometimes where I drank, something slipped into me and almost got me in a really bad situation. And before I saw it begin to occur, I stepped back and the entity came out of me. And then I saw the entity. So I've witnessed that it's okay to drink and have fun. I have no problem with that. But I usually tend to, after two drinks, I stop because I want to be in control and I know that they're just waiting for something like that. Plus the thing is, is you know, not to bring it up, but you know, my father at one point became an alcoholic um, after he played hockey and there was a, a period of time he went through that was really nasty. And it was something that I said, I'm going to be responsible to where I'm going to control myself. But don't get me wrong. I'll have a drink or two, you know, have fun. Um, but I usually have a limit, two, three, and I'm done. That's it. Oh, okay. No, nice with, with what I do too, it's it's <laughs> like I have to constantly protect myself. Yeah, and... you're very aware, aren't you? You're very uh, your your psychic awareness is, is is always on the go, really. Well, here's the crazy thing that happens too, and I've uh, it's been in some of the interviews lately. Is is I will come across somebody, and sometimes somebody, if they lose control of themselves, an entity will slip into that person and speak to me. Oh wow! And just even if it's for you know, it, usually it's just a couple words they'll say. They're like you know, we hate you oh. or. or or we're watching you, we're following you, you, we've got this and that, and they'll be like, what? And they'll deliver a message. And, and they'll slip out, and the other person won't even know that that just happened. And I've had witnesses that goes, what did that person just say? I go, they said, it goes, that's what I thought they said. What the hell? And we confront the person, like, I didn't say that. You know, and they're, they're drunk or they're not in control of themselves. I'm like, yeah, you did. And it, I go, but it's okay, it wasn't you. And... It, see, that's the thing. When you're at this level of understanding and you're at this level of experiences, when you share this with somebody else, I could see people going, oh, my God, that's crazy. That makes no sense. Well, it does make sense. I mean, your spirit is, is possessing your body right now. Your soul is possessing your body. If you're not in complete control of your body, there's the gateway to where something can just come right in for a brief moment and slip right out without you even noticing it. Mm -hmm. And we know this by protecting your thoughts. I mean, Napoleon Hill wrote – outwitting the devil and, and I'm working on something right now that where evil entities can influence you is that sometimes things pop into our head like oh my god where did I get that thought I would never what, what the? 
It's because you have an entity kind of trying to put that in your head, making you think it's yours. Yeah. And they bombard you with that at times to where you begin to think that that's your physiology or your, your psychology, your mental state, and then you start doing those things. So it's that influence which if I wasn't doing all the things I do, I may not have to worry about it so much. But when you do these things, you deal with evil spirits, they're looking for you to mess up. They're looking to find a way to get back at you. And that's all they care about. And it's, sometimes it's relentless. It won't stop. And... Uh, you know, I'm tending to believe that some of the psychological disorders out there, some of the people that are disturbed by voices are actually hearing voices, are actually being attacked by entities, and I actually have one way to prove it. And if there's any psychologist out there or therapist that doesn't believe me or would like to pursue this, let's get together somehow, some way with one of your patients that hears these voices and that's disturbed – and I'll be able to tell you whether or not they have an entity attached. And if there is an entity attached that I believe, I'll prove it to you right there. There is a gentleman in the UK that is working in exactly that way. With really? mediums. Yeah, with psychic mediums. I, I would love to know his name it's and I would love to have a conversation with him. So yeah. we need to talk about this later because I have okay. a project working on a research project that I want to pursue this and I want to document this. And I would love to get his information. Okay, I'll tell you about that afterwards, but his name is Dr. Terence Palmer. I did interview him a few, well, a couple of months ago now. I met him recently. What is his belief? What's his belief? He is a, um, he's a doctor of psychology. Okay. And he is dealing with mental health patients. Okay. And he uses a psychic medium to link in to see if it is a mental disorder or it is a psychic attachment. Wow, that's brilliant. <laughs> and Good for him. That is... And he's documenting um, all of his um, research that he's come up. And he's actually um, a member of the SPR as well, and they're very interested in his work. So, yes, yeah, so anyway, I'll, I'll give you his details later. Please, please. <laughs> um, okay, so Barry is actually in the chat room. Barry, Barry! Guy. He's in the chat room. He says hi. Um, and MJ sends her highest too. She says hi. Hi, MJ. And she wants to know how your singing is. How, how are you? Have you got a good singing voice? <laughs> Well, I hit, we'll have one or two drinks before I sing. <laughs> <laughs> See, we all need that, love. <laughs> but there's like, there's like two or three songs I can sing, and I definitely will get up there and sing um, that I enjoy singing, and I will do that, and we'll have fun. Okay, so what and are those they, songs? Give us a little heads uh, up. What the songs? Blues Brothers, Soul Man. Oh, yeah, it's classic. I like singing, but I, I sing it kind of a, J, a James Brown version of it, and uh, – you know, and then uh, believe it or not, people are going to laugh. But uh, I like a lot of Bon Scott songs. There's only a couple I can sing, and one of them is "Big Balls." <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah, Barry says that's a duet. I'm a, I'm a class. <laughs> God's gift to ballroom notoriety, <laughs> and I'll sing that song like Bon Scott, and you know, usually everybody's laughing their ass off. So. <laughs> oh, brilliant! And Barry says there's going to be a duet. I'm sure at some yeah, point. Barry can sing. Barry can sing the chorus. <laughs> I was thinking more like Endless Love between the two of you, actually. This what? Endless Love, Lionel Richie, Diana Ross. Oh, I don't know that song, sir. I might, I don't, you know. I listen to hard rock and I listen to, <laughs> you know, new age, techno, like, you know, like uh, Delirium, Enigma, Conjure One. You know, I like a little bit of rap, but I, I like the old 80s and 90s hard rock, you know, ah. some of the classic, rock, you know. I was a big heavy metal guy. You don't look like a heavy rock guy? Heavy metal yeah, ACDC, you know, um, Judas Priest, Iron Maiden. Um, I've been listening to Wasp a lot lately, which was one of my favorites when I was younger. Crocus goes on and on and on. Van wow. Halen, all that. Led Zeppelin. Oh, you surprised me. Why? What did you think I listened to? Like Frank Sinatra? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. Anyway, anyway, let's get back to um, some of the work you've done uh, before I have to let you go. You do psychic artistry. Yeah, you know, a couple of years ago, um, I, I like to go to some of these psychic fairs and, you know, uh, see some people and just go there like completely quiet and just see what other people are doing. And I remember I, I sat down, there was a psychic artist. I said, oh, I'll get my thing done, you know, and I didn't know her. She didn't know me. And she's drawing. She looks up at me. She goes, you talk to spirits. And I'm like, ah, oh, you're good. Yes. <laughs> They're saying, why aren't you doing this? I go, what do you mean? She goes, you have artistic talents. I go, yeah, I have a BA in fine art. She goes, but why aren't you doing like spirit art? And I'm like, because that's what you do. She goes, well, they say that you should be doing this too. 
She goes, you do readings, so why aren't you drawing what you see? And I'm like, uh, I don't know. I never thought of it. <laughs> so I, I, remember I went home, and, and within that week, I bought a couple supplies, and I was going to do pastels and called a buddy of mine up, and I said, hey, I want to try this. And, and I did a reading for him. I did it, and I, I was like, my God, this, you know, this is like Van Gogh. You know, and that wasn't literally like Van Gogh, but to me, it was like, wow, this is beautiful. This is something I never would have you know, thought of or seen or whatever, but it came through through my channeling through the reading. So I started doing it, and then I started going to watercolors because I like the watercolors more. And that's what I do. I do spirit art. You know, I'll sit down with somebody for about, you know, half hour to 45 minutes and I'll see their soul on the other side. And I explain that, uh, why I see that. And then some of the people coming through, loved ones or whatever, and I'll draw it. And it's pretty simplified. But when you look at it, you feel the power behind it and you feel, and especially the person that I'm drawing, they're like, oh my God, I, I recognize this. Somehow I, I, I feel this. And it's, it's pretty extraordinary that it's uh, got me back into doing art again, not just with spirit art, but working on some ideas for new projects, giant paintings and stuff that I want to do. Mm. So I feel blessed that the spirit world was kind of kicking me in the back of the head saying, hey, you're supposed to be doing this too. That's awesome because no matter how connected you are, they always surprise you at times, don't they, the yeah, spirit uh, world? I go off into so many different tangents, as you can probably tell during the radio interview. But I, <laughs> That's I, great. <laughs> I do that in my life, too. Like, I want to do this. I want to do that. I want to do this. And, you know, it gets really distracting, but there's just so many things. So, you know, I'm working on that bucket list, starting to cross stuff off. Well, I think it's always got a spirit base, though. Whatever you, you tackle, it's always got that base in spirit, hasn't it? I mean, I know you've gone away and you've done normal day jobs at times. Um, but even then, it's always brought you back to what you do yes. best, which is um, being a psychic medium and uh, in, in whatever form that takes, because there's so many areas we could have covered to, um, in this interview, um, out of body, you know, and we haven't even touched the, the influence you've actually had on paranormal investigation in regards to tech you've helped bring to the, the what we use nowadays, we all use yeah. the SB7, we all use a K2, we all look right. for temperature changes now, you know, um, and, and you've been instrumental in bringing that into the field. Yeah, I tried to do that on Help My House is Haunted, but unfortunately a lot of the stuff wasn't in there because um, I know Sandy has some contributions to the field that they didn't use some of the terminology she uses, which I think is great. So I'm really going to fight for that for the second season for them to allow her to – give that contribution to the field as well. Um, and I know Barry and I are, are working on some, you know, ideas and, and experiments to do as well. But I, like I told him, I says, you know, I'm only going to do a show if I can contribute. So my contrib contributions for the first season was to awaken people up to prayers for the dead mm -hmm. and to get out there. And when you're done with the investigation, you know, whatever spirits want prayer, whatever spirits want help to, to really do that for them. You owe that to them. You know, it's like some, walking on the street and someone asking for help. They're bleeding or they broke their arm or they're, you know, you just, you just can't walk by. You, you just asked them to do all these other things for you. Now you have to help them. You have to give something back. And for me, that's giving back. And that was the contribution I want, which I felt it was, it was shown. Uh, there was, I wish a little bit more was shown in the reciprocation on their end. But um, I believe you can see that in the series, and I'm hoping you can see more of it in the second season. But like I said, everything I've done, if I can, every single show I've ever done – there has to be a contribution. There has to be something that I know or I've learned that comes across in that show that other people can utilize as well so that we can grow, we can develop and evolve in this field to fully understand, which we're trying to do, that veil. Yeah. You know, spirit world. That's it. Exactly it. Thank you so, so much for joining me tonight. We're actually coming to the end of the show. Um, Aww. <laughs> oh, no, it's been awesome. Um, Barry um, has actually just said, help by the Beatles. He thinks you should do... <laughs> help? <laughs> That's pretty good. You know what? No, he can sing that, and I'll just stand there and look at him, and I'll go, no. <laughs> and I'm not going to help you. No, I help no, everything no. else, but I'm not going to help you. <laughs> I, might, I, might, I might sing it with him, maybe. <laughs> oh, now there we go, my beautiful people out there. <laughs> that sounds like a definite... Like I said in the show, if you'd like tickets um, or any information regarding the Sage Paracon, then please get in contact with MJ Dixon. I'm going to repeat her email for you. It's mj at sageparacon.com. 
www.parasearchradio.co.uk and if you still didn't get that then go over to the Parasearch Radio group page I will share all the details there for you or go over to Sage Paracon group page on Facebook and you'll find the details for yourselves uh, on that note thank you so so much once again Chris for joining me tonight it's been an oh, absolute pleasure um, I'd love to have you back on so we can discuss some things we didn't get a chance to discuss. No, absolutely. Thank you. <laughs> but I will be catching up with you whilst you're at the Sage Paracon, I'm sure. You got it. Well, thanks for having me. I appreciate it. Let's talk afterwards. I want to talk to you about that doctor. Yeah, no problem at all. On that note, thank you all for listening. Thank you for joining us into the chat room. And I will see you very, very soon. Don't forget, tomorrow evening, 9 p.m., Haunted Histories with Penny Morgan. Uh, Penny Morgan um, is on for a night. I always miss her middle name. How bad is that? That's a really bad presenter moment there. Um, She is talking about Ford Green Hall with Chris Cello tomorrow. That's who she's doing tomorrow night. So join us live at 9pm. And on that note, I bid you all a very farewell. Thank you for listening. Don't forget to join us for more shows throughout the week. Find us on Facebook, Twitter and the World Wide Web to keep up to date with all the shows right here on Parasearch Radio.